Good evening. My name is Seth McGowan. I'm the president of the Adirondack Sky Center here in Tupper Lake, New York. We're a not-for-profit organization uh, bringing the wonders of the universe down to earth for, uh, for people who come. We do uh, free public observing programs generally on Friday nights, uh, but uh, we've been doing other nights as well as the uh, Friday nights are not always necessarily clear, but uh, Friday nights are our mainstay. We also have private stargazing parties. Um, so if you're interested in um, proposing to your uh, fiance or uh, proposing to your boyfriend or girlfriend uh, at the observatory, we now have two of those under our belt. That's always uh, a lot of fun and pretty exciting. I try not to ruin the moment, you know, but uh, it's, it's fun. We take our uh, inflatable planetarium, the Star Lab program to local schools in the region and give them a real planetary, uh, planetary, uh, planetarium experience right during the school day. Uh, no cost to them, of course. We also have uh, some STEM related programs we do. And uh, during the summertime and during the school year too, we have after school programs for students. We're here tonight as part of the Cygnus lecture series. We've had the uh, Sagittarius A star, uh, Dr. Agnino Donahue, just uh, a few weeks ago or a few months ago, did that for us and uh, Asteroid Occultations by George Viscomi. Uh, tonight, we're here for the James Webb Space Telescope. Uh, this is the third installment of our Cygnus series. Um, in addition to the Cygnus series, we have our upcoming astrophotography conference, this four-day completely immersive event is uh, is intended for anybody interested in astrophotography and taking it to the next level, whether you're just a beginner or whether you're experienced uh, from uh, data acquisition to uh, the processing is, uh, is all inclusive, uh, very hands-on, uh, very immersive experience. So uh, give us a call or visit our website or Facebook page uh, to register if you're interested in that. Upcoming, um, we've arranged to have the uh, sun and moon conspire to meet in Tupper Lake on April 8th, 2024. It'll be a great place to be. Uh, we're, we're in totality, so I hope you have a chance to come here. We'll have all sorts of activities. We're the only uh, area in the path in New York State that has such a robust um, observatory and uh, Adirondack Sky Center-like um, facility. So we're going to have plenty to do on that day, not just in Tupper Lake, but uh, all throughout the region. But our primary activities that day will be right here in Tupper Lake. But why Tupper Lake? Uh, forgetting the, uh, the fact that it's uh, uh, an eclipse that day. Well, we do this in Tupper Lake because we are in what I refer to as the heart of darkness. We are right in the middle of the Adirondack Park. So there's no city lights uh, anywhere nearby. In fact, in this entire ring, um, we have major city uh, lights that, uh, uh, and, and folks from those cities come to Tupper Lake just for our dark skies and just for the Adirondack Sky Center Observatory. And uh, we're, we're very excited to have them again, not just from those places, but from all over. We've had uh, folks from, Europe recently, we've had uh, some South American uh, folks come up and we're excited to host people from all over the world. We're truly an international experience now. At our facility, we are doing a, a nice upgrade thanks to a grant from uh, our Congressman Billy Jones. And that is, uh, you can see the, uh, the roll off roof observatory structure there, but we're adding a uh, stamped concrete uh, viewing area to the south of our uh, observatory to make it safer for our visitors. It'll have uh, low level lighting and bench seating. So it'll make it a much more elegant and uh, safe event for folks that are there. Soon though, uh, our plan is to construct on our property, an additional building, a planetarium. And in that planetarium, we'll have a state of the art, 65 seat digital planetarium experience. Um, similar to the one that you're seeing on your screen right now. It will be on the property that we uh, currently own. And you'll see this is the observatory right in that blue circle. Um, the planetarium phase, which is the very next phase, will be situated right there on our property. So if on a cloudy night we have visitors come and suddenly the clouds roll in, which they sometimes do, uh, we can offer them an experience inside the planetarium 
right on our very own property. And that's uh, just a little schematic of what the seating will look like, because in addition to the planetarium, there'll be a multi-purpose classroom, lecture hall, event space. So uh, in addition to planetarium uh, shows, we'll be able to do a lot of other activities, including uh, hosting our own astrophotography conference, uh, doing virtual reality, um, you know, uh, school programs, the whole nine yards. So it'll be a great opportunity. And if you're interested in finding out more about that, um, or contributing to the uh, uh, to the fundraising efforts, uh, be happy to talk to you about that offline. So now on to our main event, uh, the James Webb Space Telescope live uh, panel discussion. What does it all mean? And I think the question of the the technology behind it, uh, we can find answers to pretty regularly. Um, but the what does it mean is a little bit more elusive. So this is a little different uh, than our normal Cygnus series of lectures. Tonight's format will cover three main areas of discussion. James Webb Space Telescope, why did we build it? James Webb Space Telescope, what exactly are we seeing in those pictures? James Webb Space Telescope, how is this going to change the world? So those are the three main realms. The format though, our, our uh, program tonight will start in a few minutes with our panelists uh, giving a little bit of an opening uh, statement about uh, their perceptions or their uh, views on the space telescope. Um, we'll move on from that uh, into a list uh, of curated questions that we have, and those are including those that uh, some of you offered during the registration process. Um, when we get through those questions, uh, we'll ask the panelists for some closing thoughts. And as always, we're uh, not afraid to stick around a little bit if anybody has some additional thoughts or some more questions maybe that we didn't get to or cover during the night's uh, discussion. So that's that. Let me introduce our panelists in general right now, and then I'm going to give them an opportunity to tell you more about themselves in addition to their opening statements. David Aguilar is an award-winning astronomer, author, space artist, and speaker, also probably a, uh, a board member of the Adirondack Sky Center and Observatory. Kevin Hartnett, Hubble Space Telescope Science Operations Manager at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland. Jeff Miller, astronomer in the physics department of St. Lawrence University, Adirondack Sky Center and Observatory board member proudly as well, I hope. And Eileen O'Donohue, the Henry Priest Professor of Physics at St. Lawrence University and also a, uh, an observatory uh, board member. So with that, <laughs> let me <laughs> stop that's my screen the, right, right on somebody, cue. Right somebody, on has, cue. somebody has an opinion about something already. That's the rabbit's first question. <laughs> Excellent. Sorry. So uh, let me uh, now give everybody a, a chance. As I mentioned, uh, we'll go right down that, that list and we'll stay in this view uh, through those and then we'll get to our questions. So David, let's start with you. Give us a little bit about yourself and uh, the, your, your ideas on James Webb. I had uh, been very fortunate. I've had a long background in astronomy and the science field from uh, working with science centers and aerospace corporations, Pluto mission, I was part of that. And uh, it, it's just part of who I am and the wonder, the mystery of what's out there. And so consequently for me, I began work on what we thought would be the replacement for Hubble back in 1996 with the Next Generation Space Telescope. And then after all of these decades, here it is. And uh, it's just phenomenal what we're seeing and uh, what we've been able to accomplish. So that's my joy of being part of all of this. Excellent. Thank you, David. Kevin, how about you? Yeah, so thanks for uh, inviting me to be part of the panel. I've been looking forward to it. Um, I'm retired. Actually, I retired uh, last year after 31 years working for NASA at the Goddard Space Flight Center, as you mentioned, in Greenbelt, Maryland. I'd worked for 10 years um, prior to that at Goddard as a contractor, Bendix Field Engineering Corporation. And the focus of my career has been like in the early years, um, scientific satellite control center design and testing, 
the middle years after I became a NASA employee, uh, I was the operations director for a number of scientific missions, including the Extreme Ultraviolet Explorer and the Rossi X-ray Timing Explorer. In the final 25 years, I've uh, been on the Hubble Space Telescope mission in various capacities, uh, including uh, being part of the last three uh, servicing mission, astronaut servicing missions to Hubble. I played a console role in those. And uh, when I left as an emeritus employee a year ago, my title was science operations manager. That uh, in brief means I was the technical officer on NASA's contract with the group who runs the Space Telescope Science Institute in Baltimore, Maryland. This is the group that runs the science program for Hubble. They perform science selection, observatory scheduling, instrument calibration, data pipeline processing, data archiving, and public outreach. And as a matter of fact, now that same group, which you may or may not have ever heard of, called AURA, A-U-R-A, -A, the Association of Universities for Research and Astronomy, they do the same thing for James Webb. Uh, they run the science program, but in addition, they actually fly the space bed, which uh, for Hubble, we do at Goddard with uh, the contractor Lockheed who built um, Hubble many, many years ago. So they actually have both functions, what we call mission operations and science operations that are done up at the um, Space Telescope Science Institute in Baltimore. So what does James Webb mean to me as a NASA employee and somebody who's been involved in many, many missions, some which work and some which don't. Um, I, I'm excited that NASA has a program development model for an astrophysics flagship mission that actually works. Uh, although with sizable flaws, like it's 14 years behind schedule and uh, 20 times over budget, but yet it works. And uh, we can talk more about why it shouldn't work or why some don't. Uh, but I'm glad that it works. And uh, I'm very excited that the theoretical astrophysics can now be informed by previously unattainable observations. So yep. we're you know, entering a new realm here. Great. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, Jeffrey Miller. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Seth. Uh, so I'm Jeff Miller, and I am uh, an astronomer, and I've been teaching physics and astronomy at St. Lawrence University in lovely Canton, New York. Uh, I'm starting my uh, 33rd year there. Had to do a little mental arithmetic. Um, and uh, because I'm an astronomer, I do things visually. So I have one picture I want to share with everybody. So one of the things that I did, hopefully, whoops, you're seeing my screen here. And I... In my office, I have the very first textbook that I ever had as uh, an undergraduate uh, student in college. And here it is. And I took a picture of the cover. And um, this book, The Realm of the Universe, the edition was in 1980. I actually took the class in 1982. Here's one of my homeworks. It's still actually in here. So this is year 40 for me for studying astronomy. And I opened up to the uh, inside, to the preface, and the very first sentence is, these are terribly exciting times in astronomy. Uh, pretty much every astronomy textbook can say that because it's true. And over those 40 years that I've seen uh, such tremendous changes, you might notice that the cover of this textbook has a beautiful color image of Jupiter. Uh, and that is because the Voyagers flew by in the late 1970s. So these were like brand spanking new images. Most textbooks up to this point only had black and white photos. And all of a sudden we were starting to get color. Even this textbook had some color images, but most of them were black and white. And just what we knew about the universe in terms of let's say the age, uh, when I was a student, we thought the, the age of the universe was, uh, we would say 15 billion years old. Well, that's because we thought it was either 10 billion or 20. So we took an average, but our numbers didn't really give us that number. But now we have a much more refined value, 13.8 billion years. 
And the reason that we can refine these values is because we can improve the technology that we actually use and we can get better observations of the universe. And by getting better observations, we're adding more pieces to the puzzle and we're starting to get a better image. And every year that goes by, we get a better and better understanding of our universe. So terribly exciting times is always an understatement in astronomy and it is always terribly exciting except when we're grading homework <laughs> <laughs> terribly exciting that's a great that's a, that's like good trouble right yeah <laughs> all right thanks jeff uh eileen o'donoghue hi uh thanks for uh uh letting me be on the panel um i uh have been teaching at st lawrence longer than jeff um and uh but i took i went to colorado mountain college in Glenwood Springs, Colorado. And uh, there I took an earth science class and I, I discovered that science was about nature. And none of my uh, previous schooling uh, experiences had given me the least hint that science was about nature. And then I got very excited. And so um, I uh, took an astronomy class at, that, uh, at Colorado Mountain College. We had a 14 inch telescope and I was enthralled. Uh, by what I saw and what I learned. And uh, I had been enthralled with geology. So Colorado Mountain College was a, a community college. So I had to transfer to get a bachelor's degree. So I went to Fort Lewis College in Durango, Colorado. Uh, again, had marvelous skies. And uh, uh, geology kind of lost some of its charm. And I, I uh, enjoyed uh, physics and math. And so I decided to major in physics and the way I can still kind of be a naturalist, as opposed to somebody who does the technology, the you know the uh, quantum mechanics and stuff like that, the way I can uh, uh, stay with a foot in nature is to be an astronomer. So I did that. I went on to the uh, New Mexico Institute of Mining and Technology, all places with fantastic skies uh, in Socorro, New Mexico, and I did my. Uh, PhD research with the Very Large Array Radio Telescope. So I'm actually trained as a radio astronomer, uh, not as an optical astronomer. And um, so when we look, you, you may know James Webb lo looks mostly in the infrared. And um, most of my work, and I look at galaxies in uh, radio wavelengths, and I use the Very Large Array, I use uh, uh, Arecibo, may she rest in peace, um, and now I'm using the Green Bank uh, uh, telescope. And looking at these different wave bands, there are different physical processes that glow in different, basically they're different colors uh, with a very wide color spectrum. And they teach us uh, different processes going on in the universe. We see everything very differently. So James Wedd coming on the Chandra X-ray Observatory um, has been a fantastic boon, the, um, the Spitzer Infrared Observatory. Uh, there's all this exciting stuff. And, and here, you know, I'm coming into the denouement of my career and I'm jealous of my students because they're at the beginnings of theirs and all these fabulous instruments are coming online. And James Webb is just another one and there are more in the planning. So. Uh, it is truly, Abel was right. And uh, the galaxies I studied were in Abel clusters. So uh, uh, I've, I've worked on stuff he worked on and it's just it, astronomy. The adventure continues <laughs> every day in astronomy. Well, thank you. That, there definitely seems to be some excitement among our panelists here uh, so far tonight. So let's get into some uh, some of the specifics of uh, why we're here tonight. Let's start with, you know, the, the and, and this is for all of our panelists. Uh, let's get into the big question, why we built it. Wasn't the Hubble telescope, wasn't that good enough? Well, you could say, why wasn't, you know, wasn't the Palomar telescope, the 200 inch telescope good enough? Um, you know, or every any instrument, why isn't it good enough? Why is, you know, a particular uh, medical instrument, wasn't it good enough? Well, we got a better one. Um, obviously, we always want to, 
get more information as you know astronomers we want information about everything that's in the universe stars planets galaxies and the more that we can improve our instruments the more that we can understand them and by understanding the rest of the universe we have a better understanding of of ourselves and our planet and where we're heading what our future is going to be does i'll say i'll throw something in there really quick too one of the things working in the aerospace industry that i saw and then into the research side of astrophysics is that every time we create one of these phenomenal instruments and we're going to look at something we've never seen before what we expect and why we spent all this money was to make these discoveries and answer these questions that we have listed in front of us and every single time it may answer those questions, but it opens up new doors, new windows, new questions we never thought to ask before because we didn't have that data. We didn't have that information and now we have it. And so the process starts all over again. And now we need an instrument over here and we need an instrument over here. And we may think that's peculiar to science, but it's not. That's the history of technology of our species on this planet. We catapult every time we invent and create something to another level with a whole new series of questions that need to be answered, that are calling out to be answered. And we start again and again. And that's the peculiarity of our species. And that is the beauty of science and technology working together to solve these mysteries. I'll add, um, as a NASA employee, and then one that's somewhat familiar with the structure at Goddard and across the agency, uh, some people may not know that um, NASA leans on many um, smart scientists that are outside of it itself um, for guidance on technology and scientific questions. And so there's this thing that's called the decadal survey that's done. And uh, it's conducted by the National Academy of Sciences on a decade type cadence. And they ask, what are the biggest questions in astronomy? What kind of mission do we need to actually create or design to solve those kind of questions? Where does the technology need to mature, develop so that those missions can be successful and actually do what they are intended to do. And that process actually happened. Uh, I'll be there a long time ago, but uh, the decadal survey um, looked and said, we need to see farther in the infrared and others can touch on that, you know, and we need an infrared looking telescope and, um, and uh, we, it needs to have technology so they can operate in very cold environments. So a lot of research and development money was seeded into, um, into that effort, getting a, a telescope that would actually work at you know, phenomenally cold uh, temperatures. Um, so that actually worked you know, for, for the next generation space telescope now called James Webb. Uh, but I'm, 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 I'm happy for that. And uh, just as David was saying during the course of Hubble's lifetime. Uh, of course, there were the first discoveries of exoplanets and it became clear that there's a very big cosmic question about the nature of the expansion of the universe and the speed at which it's actually happening. Um, and uh, big questions about when the galaxies formed and Hubble can't answer them because it can't look far enough back. So um, those actually became the three itemized goals of James Webb to increase the look back time um, to the era of star and galaxy formation to discern the properties of Earth sized planets and to better measure the expansion rate of the universe. Those are kind of the three fundamental questions that are on James Webb's plate to answer. So, in, in terms of that, 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 that's an excellent point, Kevin. In, you know, uh, the, the question always uh, is it looks further back in time, you know, that that's kind of the way it, it seems to be framed. So, you know, the question of what, what does this do that the Hubble didn't do? And one of those answers seems to be, well, it looks further back in time. Can, can somebody explain, you know, 
to to us lay people. Uh, how does it do that exactly? Well, um, I can I can uh, start with this, and it's a a, um, a good question. And any time you look out from yourself, you're seeing into the past because the light which you use to sense even the people in the room it takes time to move from those people to your eyeball. And uh, in day-to-day -day life, that doesn't make much of a difference. But when we look out to the stars, it does start making a difference. The, the sun itself is eight light minutes away. The moon is 1.3 light seconds. So you never see the moon now. You see it 1.3 seconds ago. And uh, as we look at stars like Deneb, which is a bright star in the summer sky, in the summer triangle, uh, those of you who are out there tomorrow night will be able to see it. It's high and bright. It's about 1400 light years away. So we're seeing that star as it was 1400 years ago, right? So that would have been, you know, in the 600s and life on earth was very different. And as we look out to the galaxies, the galaxies that, uh, that I study are, you know, 140 million light years away. So I'm seeing those you know, back in the age of the dinosaurs. Um, and and the, uh, the other complication is, so we're always, whenever we look at distant objects, we're looking farther back in time. And um, the universe, on top of this, the universe is expanding. And uh, what that means is that the, it sends out a light wave that has a certain wavelength and the expansion stretches it. And as the wave gets longer, it gets redder. We hear this when you, you know, you watch a, a race car or you watch a, a, a car race on TV. You know, what's the sound? It's you know, you know. And that's because the sound waves get squished when the car is coming at us. They get lengthened as the car is coming going away. If the car goes faster and faster away from us, it's gonna get down into the sounds we can't hear. So then the whales have to listen to it or, or whoever can hear those deep frequencies. It's the same with light. And so galaxies emitting invisible light um, where they are, uh, as the universe expands and we're looking at those galaxies, that, that light gets redder and redder. The farther out they are, the redder that light is. And it's so red, even though they emitted invisible light that we're used to, it's now infrared light. And so we can't see those galaxies with Hubble. They're little red smudges, if they're even there. And now with James Webb, they're these complex, beautiful galaxies. The Hubble, the, the James Webb deep field is the image I'm most in love with because I do galaxies. And, and there are side-by-side -side comparisons. And maybe I could even uh, show one of those. Um, let me share my screen. And so this shows, so this is the Hubble image. And so, yeah, there are these little, you know, blurs. You can see these. Here is James Webb. Okay, and this is a star. You can see it's much brighter here. But look at these. These are almost like dolly painted, these galaxies on the sky. It's so exciting. Look at this. This is the warped image of a galaxy. Uh, think of, uh, um, uh, you know, take a, a wine glass and break the stem and use the base of it and put a picture on a, you know, on the table and move that stead, that bottom part of the wine glass around on top of the image. And you'll see these arcs like this. But this isn't a wine glass that's warping it. It's gravity itself that this in the foreground, these galaxies that we could see with Hubble, well, those, so they, they're, they're, they were, look how red they were in Hubble and here they're white. And with these arcs in the background, we couldn't hardly even see because they were so red. So I'll stop my share. You know, that uh, there's a couple of questions from the uh, registration that uh, kind of bring, uh, bring this to mind. And, and that is, what what's the furthest object we've seen so far and and how exactly do you tell how far away it is when you're looking at it when a, when a you know a state trooper tags me with his radar gun 
he's bouncing something off and it's coming back to his gun. There's, it, it doesn't work that way, I suspect. How, are, how do we know that something is, you know, 800 light years away or 10,000 light years away? Uh, because of that uh, redshift, uh, the Doppler effect that Eileen was just talking about, uh, it affects sound waves, it affects light waves. And so if something is moving away from you, then the wavelengths of known elements and molecules actually get shifted to uh, longer wavelengths. And uh, so far, I actually looked up to see what currently is the, uh, the furthest object and something was actually uh, has been observed and they're still observing it uh, just earlier this year. Um, and they're not quite sure what it is, but it's 13.5 billion light years away. And remember, we think that the universe is about 13.8 billion years old. So this is some object, again, still not sure what it is and it hasn't been observed uh, with James Webb yet. It was observed by some large uh, Earth-based, uh, ground-based uh, telescopes and a few uh, satellite-based telescopes. Um, but this is something that was created at the, you know, within, uh, you know, a few million years, a few hundred million years after the Big Bang. And so basically what we're seeing is a shift in the spectra that tells us its distance, it tells us the velocity, that's how we can actually determine it. So like you say, unlike the uh, the radar signal that's bouncing off of your car from a uh, police car when you're speeding by, we're, we're looking at the actual light coming from that object. And keep in mind what the distance of a, um, uh, of a light year is, it's six trillion miles, one light year. So that's a different, the distance that you would travel if you were going at the speed of light. So that's a six with uh, 12 zeros after it. And we're talking about, you know, billions of light years away. So we're talking about very, very distant objects. So, yeah, so it, it's, it's actually really neat that we can tell distances and speeds and motions just by examining that light that reaches our telescopes. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you. Um, one of the questions that we've also got is the about the timeline uh, of construction uh, for for the future, uh, future either improvements or uh, future space telescopes. We had a, a gap in time from Hubble until James Webb. I, is there something already being uh, thought of down the road? Yes, indeed. Uh, Ken, the uh, decadal survey just put out another uh, uh, release, if you will, uh, given casting a vision for the future. And um, uh, short of that, there's uh, missions like the Nancy Roman Space Telescope that's supposed to launch in about uh, five years from now, 2027, I think is the, the latest launch date for that, um, a Goddard mission. Um, and there's some there, being made by the Europeans and whatnot. But uh, one of the big ones uh, that the decadal survey is looking forward to is one called Louvoir, which uh, has been heavily studied for the last, I'd say five years, maybe more. Um, one of the things that uh, after Hubble is gone, we, we have a hole in is uh, a space mission that can do high fidelity ultraviolet observations. Um, James Webb can't because it was designed to be infrared. And uh, Chandra and Spitzer, you know, are in their own wavelengths, uh, X-ray and, and infrared. We don't have a big ultraviolet uh, observatory out in space right now. And so that's, that's one of the, uh, the areas where we're trying to plug a hole. There's another, there's another area too, and I want to jump in here because you're very space oriented. And my background has been split between ground-based and space. Space is sometimes five to 10 times more expensive than ground-based facilities, yeah. just because of the nature of launch and maintaining them and keeping them in orbit and the expense of the programs. We have two, if not three major, huge observatories coming online in the next five to eight years. We have the extremely large telescope by the Europeans, all ground-based. We have the Magellan telescope coming online, and we'll wait to see if the 30 meter makes it up on Mauna Kea. 
but these are monster telescopes that turn anything like okay. like uh, uh, telescopes that we're using today from the ground, like finder scopes in size compared to some of these monsters that are coming along. So outer space and ground-based go hand in hand. The very large arrays, the arrays, the, the radio telescope arrays in, uh, in Australia and other areas complement this. And the beauty is we don't depend upon one telescope anymore to give us our data. Yeah, the next generation very large array is going in too. And it's huge. The square kilometer array is, yeah. is yeah, the ones that all of this stuff, the Rubin Observatory uh, is being built in Chile. There's the, the CCAT. There are all these observatories being built, all looking at different wavelengths. Um, and uh, so we have so much information that actually, you know, as a, 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 a research astronomer, it, you don't have to go do your own observing anymore. Uh, some of these, like the uh, Sloan Digital Sky Survey, they've had an a, a, a automated telescope. It just does the scanning. This is what the Rubin Observatory is going to do. It observes a pattern every night. And the data are, since these are national and international observatories, the data are released to the public. You might have it privately for a year if you're the primary observer, but these big survey telescopes, nobody has it. It's just released to the public once the data are, are, are processed and made usable. And so young astronomers who couldn't possibly get telescope time, they can go and get the data themselves and do very interesting projects. So we're not dependent on any single telescope. Very true. It was said earlier that it's a golden age for astronomy. Uh, we haven't even talked about things like gravitational wave astronomy, which is going to inform, you know, find events that other telescopes then will want to point at, try to catch the transients from uh, two black holes colliding together, this kind of thing. Um, it's a interesting fun fact, not to get off the rails here, but uh, most people don't know that Hubble and James Webb do not slew, as we call it, or move from one target to another very quickly at all. They're massive and they're, they're moved by uh, rotating wheels inside called reaction wheels, uh, which don't have a lot of what the engineers call torque authority. They don't have much authority to move a, a big uh, bus size thing um, or tennis court size thing like James Webb. So for instance, with Hubble, it takes a full 15 minutes to move 90 degrees. So Hubble moves at the uh, top rate at, of the minute hand on a clock. And uh, if I have it right, James Webb is like three times slower than that. <laughs> so, um, so there's a lot of science that can be done by those missions, but there's also so much exciting science that happens to be able to rapidly uh, respond. And, and these big missions aren't really designed for that. Uh, so it's a, it's a time where you need every kind of telescope and every kind of wavelength with every kind of uh, visibility um, to really solve the problems. Before we leave this, uh, this part of the discussion, um, and, and that's you know, why, why we built the thing, um, one of our uh, questions is, what, what is the most anticipated discovery that James Webb is supposed to make? Oh, I know what that is for me. <laughs> Life on another planet. Mm. We yeah, are not so alone. Looking, I mean, they're re what they're really looking for is free oxygen yeah. on another yeah. world. Yeah, oxygen occurs, but not to the percentage we find in our atmosphere. That's been created by life. And if we start finding atmospheres that are in the 20 percentiles, there's something going on on that planet. And it's it's basically probably mimicking some of the same processes we see for life here on Earth. That to me is the, the golden chalice of the discovery <laughs> from James Webb. Yeah, and, and people uh, in, the, you know, in the audience here may not realize that oxygen is a very reactive gas, yeah. which is why when, when somebody you know, is getting mm -hmm. oxygen, everybody has to be careful. You know, when somebody was in oxygen, tent, <laughs> it blows up really easily. And so for us to have as much free oxygen as we have on Earth is incredible. And it took, 
you know, the better part of 4 billion years to build up to this level, because initially when oxygen was released, it just rusted all the rocks. And, and when it rusted all the rocks, they- and that's, how, and that's how we trace it back, because that's the question we get. How do we know that the, the earth, when it was formed, wasn't just full of oxygen? It wasn't. It rusted and, and held up in the rocks like a safe to be opened for us to see it. And we see in the atmosphere in these rocks that the, the oxygen builds and builds and builds over hundreds of millions of years yeah. as green plants produce it, as photosynthesis begins producing well, it. Life pond scum. life. Pond scum produced the first bits of it. I mean, the pond scum polluted the atmosphere so badly that there was a big die-off. <laughs> of creatures that didn't, that were yeah, born they they live in oxygen. You know, yeah. but it, it built up and then it dropped. It built up and dropped. So we see these bands of red rocks and then gray rocks and red rocks again. Yeah. So let me ask each of the panels. We'll go one down the road. In the answer to the question why we built it, is it safe to say, or, or on a scale of one to 10, where would you put uh, 10 being the primo uh, and, and, you know, one being the lesser important? that essentially it's uh, searching for life elsewhere. David? Number one. Okay, that, that's low, but we'll go with your scale instead. Number one reason, we'll go with the one being the most important, 10 being the least important. Eileen? Well, I'm more like uh, with a five or six because my interest is in the deep universe and in the, in the galaxies and quasars. And that's for me the exciting part, the deep field. I don't want to look at the the the, the spectrum of the atmosphere. I want to look at the deep field, the galaxy. Jeff. Uh, yeah, you know, if if you have a, a dozen astronomers in the room, and we have at least four here, you know, uh, where we're going to get, you know, twenty different opinions, because each person has their own specialty of interest, whether it be life on planets or figuring out more about the universe. So, life on, you know, I think would be exciting. I'll give it a seven. Um, uh, well, are we doing seven out of ten? Well, or, or maybe the other way, three. I've, lo I've okay, lost if we're track. starting with we'll yeah. seven out of ten. I'll do ten out of ten. <laughs> yeah. All right, I'll do All right. seven out. Of 10. I'll give you eleven out of ten. <laughs> Kevin, how about you? Well, if we're ranking the excitement of the question or the problem, then I, I certainly agree with David that the number one would be: uh, Is there life out there? Are we alone? That's one of uh, NASA's. Uh, major driving questions that's behind all its programs and uh, missions. But for the design of the James Webb, from what I've read, now I'm not an expert, um, they didn't really optimize the wavelength bands to be able to see um, the, the oxygen line that you normally would, would want to look for in, in infrared. Um, seeing, characterizing the, the the atmospheres of exoplanets, especially Earth-like, Earth-sized planets is one of the major goals, but uh, they don't list it as a major goal of this mission to detect life or they might've designed it a bit different. Again, the three that are the stated goals of the mission are to look back in that era and see when the stars and galaxies first began to form, uh, which there's nothing that can look that far right now. Uh, so that's a primary goal of it, then to extra, uh, to um, to look at exoplanet atmospheres, and then to try to get a handle on this uh, H naught or the expansion rate of the universe problem. Um, that's that's one of the big goals. So finding life again, I'd say you know that's the most exciting question. But is what's James Webb's primarily goal? Is it you know, it, I put it down at seven or eight on its primary goals. Okay. And, and I agree with you, and I agree with you for two reasons. One, when the James Webb was being designed, that was not part of the program. Because at that point in 96, 97, 98, they didn't know how to categorize exoplanet atmospheres. They didn't even know if there were exoplanets out there yet. Right. So Webb was not designed for that. However, it is now, if you go up to the website I did today, it is the fourth. It is number fourth now to search for life 
and atmospherics of alien planets. They've added that in there because all of these were discoveries were made in 2004, 2005, 2006. The die was already cast for Webb. The instruments were already being built. So they were behind the curve. If, if Webb had launched in 2008, 2009, like it was supposed to, we probably would have something in its place right now looking specifically for life in the universe. Okay. But because it was delayed for so long, the earlier instruments didn't even take that into account because we didn't know we could do it. Right, All so right. it's a shame that we can't uh, look exactly in the wave bands that we want, but we'll certainly have a mission that'll do that. So that's a, that, that's a couldn't ask for a better segue. Uh, the, the question is, what is it that we're seeing in these pictures exactly from the James Webb? And I know that there's an overlap between the wavelengths that, uh, that Hubble was able to see and what James Webb uh, is able to see. So what are, the, what are the pictures? How are they different? We know, Jeff, you showed us a, a, a comparison a few minutes ago. That was a great example. But what is the, I mean, what, what is the exact you know, difference in the pictures? Well, we're looking at uh, different wavelength ranges. And um, astronomers use the entire electromagnetic spectrum everything from the shortest wavelength, highest energy gamma rays uh, to the longest wavelength, lowest energy radio waves. So we put all these things together to get a more complete picture. Um, so what we're actually seeing in some of those images, like the one that Eileen showed, the comparison of the two oh, uh, yeah. deep field images, uh, is that you know with, with uh, James Webb, we can see more of the infrared light. So what is that telling us? That's, there's a lot more um, uh, dust in our uh, universe. There's plenty of dust out there. That's sort of part of the material that makes planets and, and stars. And uh, we can see it more readily. We can see objects more readily through that dust. That's one of the things we can see. We can see ring features more readily. So we're enhancing our knowledge, our view of what we can actually see by looking at these longer, redder wavelengths. And one of the questions from uh, our registration, what is the longest wavelength that we've detected so far? Oh, well, that's in, that's in the radio wave realm. I mean, we regularly observe at 90 centimeters. Um, okay. and, uh, and that's like, we observe uh, you know, in the FM band, the only observatory that can see those frequencies, because all the rest of us have FM radios, is in India, where they have the uh, giant meter wave radio telescope. So we, yeah, that's, that's, those are the longest ones we regularly look at. So are these actual colors that we're seeing in the uh, images? Are these the real colors like we would take with a, you know, a, a snapshot? No. How does that get translated? What, how much has to be done? to these uh, images in order for them to look like they do for us. I'll jump in. Many of the images, they have picked a specific color for an element that they have picked up like oxygen or sodium or nitrogen, and they will assign that color to it so that it differentiates from other elements. Because what you're really looking at here is a scan of a beautiful dust cloud the one above is Hubble. It's more in the visible wavelength, what our eyes would see. But down below, there is so much more data. There is so much more activity, so much more happening because we're pulling up wavelengths that are invisible to the human eye, but we use every day. I mean, we take x-rays to see broken bones. We take uh, ultraviolet to take a look for cancer in people's bodies, infrared to look for cancer. So what they're doing is they're now assigning different colors to the elements, and I see oxygen in there, I see sodium in there, uh, there's all lithium in there. There's an amazing abundance of elements that we're now seeing in these clouds that tell us all this stuff we take for granted on Earth is floating out there in space. It's a laboratory for life. Right, so the sh short answer is, it doesn't look like this as your eye because your eye can't see it. There it uh, is. <laughs> uh, but, uh, um, it's, it's interesting. I'm sure you'll get into this in your astrophotography conferences coming up. Um, Hubble's kind of adopted what's now called the Hubble palette, 
where certain wavelengths that aren't visible with the naked eye are assigned colors. Uh, the H alpha um, color is, is green, sulfur two is red and oxygen three is blue. And that's kind of a, a standard Hubble palette that amateur astronomers will use to color their observations. But it's not what you'd actually see if you flew a spaceship up there. Again, because a lot of that stuff, your eye just can't see. So that that's a great point, Kevin. And uh, in in astrophotography, we do those that HSO palette, that Hubble palette, with monochrome cameras. So are these are the James Webb? Are these the same? Are the, these come to us in uh, in monochrome uh, as monochrome images, and then we translate them? Yes, yes. they're okay. just different frequencies. Okay. Yeah, and the other thing that, um, you know, I mean, particularly since it's seeing an infrared, think about night vision uh, goggles, you know, and how the firemen go into to smoke filled homes, you know, or buildings, and they can see that somebody is huddled under a desk, because that person is glowing in infrared. And so they can see those wavelengths through the smoke and dust. And so in this image, so a lot of stuff is blocked by dust up here. And when we look with James Webb, we can see these stars because in the infrared, the starlight gets through the dust instead of being blocked by it. And that is part of what's so wonderful. We're seeing more of what's there. And here is uh, Stefan's Quintet. Here is uh, the Southern Ring Nebula. And we're seeing a lot more detail um, in, in the James Webb images. I, I, Eileen, I wanted to jump in really quick to amateur astronomers out there, and I have a, a note of suggestion for you. If you are ever given the opportunity to look at the sky through infrared military goggles, don't do it. It will ruin, it will ruin the sky for you. I was once on Vinyl Haven Island, I put those suckers on. Yeah, I could see deer walking through the trees over there. And when I looked up at the sky, satellite, 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 meteor, <laughs> meteor, meteor, satellite, satellite, <laughs> nebula, galaxy, nebula, galaxy. Oh my God, Milky Way does look like somebody painted it across the sky. Ruined the sky for me. <laughs> Thank you for that, David. <laughs> uh, a question well, to Seth. Seth, back to your, your yep. question about what are we seeing? Uh, I want to call people's attention to it if they didn't see it today. But just today in a press release, it, it says that uh, Webb has imaged uh, an exoplanet. And that's something that Hubble has maybe done once or twice. But those are kind of... Um, you know, not real firm observations. Uh, Foma Holt B, for instance, um, a planet around that, there's some questions of whether they really saw a planet or not. But uh, this is something that James Webb can do with this coronagraph uh, feature, blocking out the starlight and looking really close to the, to the bright star to find a faint planet next to it. So this is very, very exciting. Um, it's a hundred times farther than Earth is from the sun, um, which is about two and a half times the sun-Pluto distance. It's it's down in the uh, uh, southern hemisphere, so it's in uh, Centaurus, and it's about seventh magnitude star. But this this James Webb will do a lot of. Uh, James Webb was designed to do a lot of this, and so this is very exciting. One of the questions that came up uh, in the registration was, uh, and I'm going to quote exactly. Uh, what spectral analysis can be done which will permit an observation of an exoplanet to be said to be consistent with life? Eileen, take it. Ah, well, uh, they did uh, release the spectrum. I'm looking for the uh, image of the spectrum that um, uh, when we can uh, look at an object and <clears throat> think of passing the light through a prism, or better, think of bouncing the light off a CD that happens to be sitting on your, your windowsill, you know, just a compact disc, and you get the rainbow from that. Well, we have uh, a, a, um, gratings that are etched much more finely than your CD. And so we split the light up into the spectrum. And 
when different molecules and uh, uh, atoms glow, uh, they glow in certain wavelengths because they're due to vibrations or you know, energy jumps or something like that. So every element and every molecule has a very characteristic syst uh, uh, a set of lines in which it glows. And we're really good at picking out those sets of lines. You know, chemists have been helping, you know, we, we, we know those and we do these. When I observe galaxies, I observe the spectrum. I don't look at a picture of a galaxy. I look at the, the amount of radiation emitted at each uh, different frequency. And so knowing those patterns of lines, that's how we can look um, for the presence of oxygen. And so if somebody else will talk, I'll look for that spectrum. We can talk about it. <laughs> so uh, this, I'm not sure if, uh, this, if we've already talked through this already, but uh, there's a question, will there be any mission to upgrade web, say to see oxygen and planetary atmosphere better, or is it too far away for an upgrade? too far away. It's a million miles away. And that's why everybody was so nervous because, I mean, the project was, as been said, it's way, it was way over budget and really late. I mean, when I was teaching astronomy classes regularly every year, I would have to change the projected launch date on the slide when I was talking <laughs> about when. I had to keep advancing and advancing and advancing it. Um, and uh, you know, especially unfurling the uh, the, the uh, protective uh, sail to uh, protect protect the instrument from uh, the sun, because it was they used origami basically to fold this thing up. And if it tore or there was any significant damage to it, there was no way. You know, there's uh, you know, even if we still had a, an active shuttle program, um, it's a million miles away whatever happens to it, that's it. It's there, you know, and if it can't be corrected with software or anything else, that's it. So there are no upgrades, unlike with Hubble. Hubble is only, only orbits at about 350 miles above the earth. So that was much easier to reach. And, and the interesting aspect about Webb compared to other telescopes, there's no way to cool it except with these blankets. There is no coolant on board, which on many other spacecraft, especially infrared spacecraft, eventually run out and Spitzer, it ran out. And so we kind of turned it off and, and parked it on the side of the road. Uh, Webb was not built that way. Webb was built because it needs to be incredibly cold to pick up these faint heat signatures uh, in the infrared wavelengths. It was built to cool itself by these amazing blankets. And, and that's why it is a different technology. And to be honest, it was a tough build, but we pulled it off. That's it right. Worked. I would say too, in defense of those, imagine it was your job, like you're a member of the, the decadal survey and you're trying to forecast where technology is gonna be for a mission that's starting to be manufactured now but probably won't be operational for 10 years. So what are the computers going to look like in 10 years? Yeah. What are the, what are the uh, detectors going to look like in 10 years? What are the, the actuators and, and, and uh, you know, all the parts of the spacecraft going to look like in 10 years? Well, um, on James Webb, they got it wrong. You know, you budget for a certain amount of technology development, but on James Webb, it didn't happen as fast. And so the mission was delayed, but not because it was a bunch of people sitting on their hands, not doing their work. It's just, you rely on things that don't even exist when you're designing these spacecraft. So it's a very difficult thing to do. And that's why I said at the opening, we have a, a method that although it was very slow over budget and whatever, the method worked. It was the best scientists thinking of the biggest problems, designing uh, a spacecraft, and then uh, seeding money into technologies that could actually work. And that all came together, albeit late and over budget. I, I just want to say one little note to that, and then I'll shut up. Years and years and years and years ago, I found myself sitting at a table with James Burke, who's the author of The Day the Universe Changed. He was a Brit. And we were bemoaning that Hubble didn't work. We launched this thing, it didn't focus, we had problems. And he said, David, stop. Let me put this into perspective for you. 
no other nation could have built the Hubble Space Telescope. And so you pooched it. It's not quite working correctly, but no other nation is now going to go into outer space and fix it, but you are. This is the United States of America and your science and your technology. Yeah, Webb took a while to get into space, but wait till you see what we're going to discover with it. And that comes out of the young engineers, the enthusiasts, the scientists, the technologists, all the people working on this one mission over all of these years. We should be very proud of it. We really should. You're exactly right. It's a technological wonder, just like Hubble, uh, but in space. You know, uh, one, one question that, uh, that does keep coming up uh, over and over again, and Mark reminded me of it here, is how do they decide what to target with the web? So I can answer that because uh, this has been my job. Uh, uh, there's, a, there's a call that goes out once a year for Hubble and, and uh, James Webb has adopted the same approach. Remember, it's the same contractor that's running the science program for both these missions. Um, and so they put out a call for proposals to everybody in the world, send us your best idea to use uh, James Webb. And, um, and they, they have it be focused on science. and you're not even allowed to submit your name or your organization. It's anonymous. Mm. And then they convene somewhere between 100 and 150 scientists uh, to read these things, to rank them, and to make recommendations to the head of the Space Telescope Science Institute, a guy named Ken Sembach right now. Interestingly, this will be to a lot of people, it's the director of the Space Telescope Science Institute, a contractor that decides who gets to use NASA's Hubble Space Telescope and James Webb Space Telescope. But it's really based on the recommendations from a, a broad uh, and deep set of uh, reviewers, Europeans, um, from people from all over the world that uh, are, are part of that, what they call Telescope Allocation Committee. And, and they make recommendations and they, they argue it out, uh, basically. Who's sent in the best idea? Who seems to know the most about the instrument? Uh, have they explained why uh, they can't do this observation on Spitzer? Um, why do they need James Webb? And it's the best ideas and the that get the telescope done. Great. All right, so let me move to the, uh, the, the, the last word, the, the section I'll refer to as, as the last word. Uh, be before we, you know, open up for some Q and A, um, and that is, uh, how will the James Webb change the world, and how will looking back in time help us look forward? Let me start with you, Eileen. It uh, it tells us how the universe works uh, about its origin and its evolution. It really tells us the story of ourselves because we're made of the universe. We're all made of star stuff. And um, so it, it tells us all of that. It teaches us physics that, that um, we uh, don't yet know. And it engages our curiosity and our wonder. These images come out and the, everybody who saw these first images is just, wrapped up in wonder my god it's an amazing universe look what what we can see and it's a positive thing about humanity that is the the universe studying itself and so it enhances our sense of wonder it teaches us physics it teaches the history of ourselves and it's so much better than figuring out how to build a better better bomb <laughs> i mean it just really engages why can't we get people that want to go die going to Mars instead of, you know, blowing up a marketplace or something? So it engages our sense of wonder. I think that's that's how these scientific instruments change the world and how Artemis is going to help, too. You know, and we hope it's going to launch on Saturday and that it's not going to crash anywhere. <laughs> it's the valves, guys. It's the valves. <laughs> 
Jeff, well, that would be a big step in getting a radio telescope on the far side of the moon, which I'm sure you'd be uh, thrilled with. <laughs> <laughs> we, could, we could observe in the FM band. <laughs> Jeff, how about you? Last, last thoughts. Uh, well, I'll echo some of what Eileen uh, has said. And considering we've been working together for over three decades, it's no surprise that we have very similar thoughts about a lot of things. Uh, but but humans by their very nature are inquisitive creatures. We want to know what's going on, uh, not only in our own living rooms, but in the world around us. And uh, just getting a better idea of, you know, what our own origins are, okay? And by studying more of the universe and how it actually developed, we get a better picture of where we came from as well. And again, where are we going? What is in the future for us? And so just developing that better picture and the excitement that I need talked about, that is really, it's exciting for astronomers, but, but for people who just are watching the news, I was gonna say reading the news with not many people reading the newspapers anymore. Um, uh, but then, you know, that's how young people get caught up in this stuff. It's like, you know, this is really cool. Maybe this is something I want to study. Uh, and even if it's not astronomy, you know, they'll take an astronomy class, but they're still interested in science and technology. And with advancements in those ranges, always in, uh, comes better improvements to human life. And, and that's, that's the whole name of the game. Very exciting. Yeah. Kevin, how about you? Well, uh, so I, I think I've said my piece. I'm very excited to see what uh, James Webb will uh, in, inform the scientific uh, theoreticians, you know, with actual observations uh, and uh, weed out one theory against another. Uh, that's how science advances. And uh, so very, very excited to see James Webb uh, working. It's just, <laughs> Phenomenal that it's working. Um, I listened to uh, a talk by the senior engineer. Again, this is a Goddard mission. So he gave a talk at Goddard, said that there are something like 135 single point failures on this mission. And a lot of them had to do with the, the deployments, the deployment of that five layer sun shield and the secondary mirror and, and tuning, you know, the, the 18 segments uh, to down within a wavelength of light. I mean, the things that it's done technologically are just, just incredible. And they all seem to have gone flawlessly. So um, we're better prepared now. We have more propellant on board to, to, to last maybe more than 10 years. Um, and this, the, the telescope and instruments seem to be performing better than uh, they, you know, were, were designed in, in the way kind of a, a low level you know, first level design goal, they, they all exceeded that. So this is a very, very exciting time. And uh, I'm glad that Hubble was still operating too, because we can get parallel observations in the UV and visual with the infrared, and, and it's going to transform um, our understanding of the heavens. Excellent. David, how about you? I'm a little bit more basic in all of this. I, I asked really basic questions. And one of those is, how do you know where you're going if you don't know where you've been? And that is the basis of all of this research and what every one of these scientists and engineers have been talking about. We are taking a look at how it began, where we've been, because we can now begin projecting ahead and oddly enough, you may find this disconcerting, but the answer is yes, there may well be an end eventually to the universe. Think about this information. Up until the 1930s, we didn't even know how big the universe was or what the universe contained. We have come this far and know that there was a beginning, there is a middle, and then more than likely there will be an end. What a huge piece of knowledge for a tiny little species that stood upright about three million years ago and started crawling over this planet and looking up at the stars at night. These are the questions we're asking, but these are the questions we're answering with our instruments, with our knowledge. It affects our future. It affects the future of everything. Uh, 
And now with everybody scratching their heads, the big question is, are there other universes coexisting right along with ours? How big is this plan? How far does it go? And yet here we are in our daily lives, going to work, getting speeding tickets occasionally and paying our bills. But we are also asking questions that no other creature on this planet has ever asked. Where did we come from? Where are we going? I think I can answer that question. That's the beauty of it for me. And, and are we alone? Are we alone? <laughs> and do they have good Chinese takeout? <laughs> Actually, I want the New Mexican takeout, you know? <laughs> I haven't had a good Mexican meal since I left Socorro. Uh oh, uh oh. This has been uh, very, very, uh, very exciting uh, to talk with you all. Uh, we've answered so many of the questions that came in um, in the course of the registration, um, but uh, of course we'll we'll stick around for a minute. Before we do that, um, I'm going to put some links into the chat for everybody. Uh, there, there, information about the Adirondack Sky Center, our website, Facebook page. This uh, session will be posted on our YouTube channel sometime over the weekend. Um, and if you're interested in the astrophotography conference, it's not too late to register, but it's close to being too late. And if you're interested in talking to us about uh, helping to build our planetarium, uh, there are uh, a, a number of ways to do that. So I'd, I'd love to talk to you more about that. So that's in the chat uh, right now. So before we do, I, I want to, um, you know, open it up a little bit and see uh, if anybody has any, any remaining thoughts or questions or anything that we didn't get to um, during, the, during our, our, our session with these four, four big brains. Is it just that intimidating? Is that the idea? No, we were that complete and thorough. That's what the problem is. <laughs> I, I will say, I do want to say that, um, you know, one thing that I've, I've said over and over again, uh, if you look at, uh, at, at a media, uh, print media, television media, social media, over the past, I don't know, 18 to 24 months, there is an, a, a significant increase in astronomy related content. Um, television commercials uh, are the ones that come to mind. Um, we now are seeing more and more commercials where there's an astronomy factor built into it. My, my, one of my favorites is, the, you know, a little girl sitting at a table eating her morning cereal, whatever it is, and she's got like an imaginary space helmet on. You know, it's, it, you have to look for these things, but there is, it, it's pervasive these things are coming out more and more. And I think because of the excitement of things like James Webb and Curiosity and all of the other things going on uh, for us here on Earth regarding out there, I, I do, I agree. I think there's an excitement and I think that uh, it's catching on. It, it feels contagious. And, you know, one of the things that we didn't mention is the in, are the technological advances that come from these endeavors. Um, you know, that we do come up with new technological solutions and those end up migrating their way out into uh, the culture. So. Eileen, I want to make one quick point. I worked on uh, the repair of the Hubble Space Telescope and I also worked on the, the original instruments that went in. And one of the grandest discoveries we made was the sensor chip that we put into the near-infrared NICMAS instrument that went into Hubble, it worked marvelously for finding breast cancer in women. There you go. Mm. Outer space, breast cancer. Yeah. Yeah. That's how it works. Absolutely. Yeah, there's a, uh, there's a science writer up at the Space Telescope Science Institute who had the job of writing a, uh, a paper on that very thing, the technology transfer that was happening between that IR uh, detector development and uh, mammography. And as it turned out, there's a video now that's on the, on the Space Telescope Science Institute website. It turned out her life was saved by that very technology. Wow. So wow. how cool is that? Bringing outer space down to earth. 
That's yeah. it. That's, that's, our, that's the Adirondack Sky Center Observatory for you. That's when we study the universe, we study ourselves. Eileen, I love that. That's your next book. <laughs> <laughs> I got to go, folks. This has been wonderful. All right. Thank you, David. And thank you, everybody. Take care, David. Fun. Appreciate it. And uh, we'll see you again soon. Adios. Bye, Thanks, Tina. everybody, for coming tonight. And uh, look for us in the near future for our next installment in the Cygnus series. Thanks for coming, everybody. Good night. Good night. Bye -bye. Good night.